It was January 5th, 1943, and Allied artillery suddenly became far deadlier. The same guns, just overnight, started shooting down German and Japanese aircraft with never-before-seen effectiveness. Soon, they turned their sights on German infantry. The results were horrifying. What the Allies came up with was a strictly guarded secret that, in large part, helped them win the war. So, let's start from the very beginning, so it all makes sense. Heavily influenced by the lessons from the First World War, where up to 75% of all casualties came from artillery, in the 1930s it was still seen as the king of the battle. Before the Second World War, the focus was on pretty much the same three old principles of counter-battery fire, interdiction, and infantry support. Counter-battery meant basically dueling with the enemy artillery battery, trying to locate and destroy them before they found you. Interdiction was to fire shells deep behind enemy lines to disrupt supplies, troop movements, and reserve units before they even reach the battle. And third, of course, directly supporting friendly infantry in battle, giving them heavy, high explosive firepower exactly where they needed it. Although precision of early artillery was far from being exactly where needed, a typical firing mission was conducted with approximate coordinates given to the artillery battery. They then did calculations by hand using paper maps, rulers, and angle boards, then fired a salvo and waited for the forward artillery observer to tell them by wire telephone or later radio where shells fell. They would then adjust their fire accordingly and guide the shells onto target. As the Second World War broke out, all armies were using pretty much the same artillery doctrine as from the previous war, now just improved with better communication systems and slowly introducing motorized artillery instead of horse-drawn. But they still relied on massed fire and days-long bombardment preparation to soften up enemy positions as the key to victory. However, everything would drastically change within a few short years, with only a couple revolutionary inventions introduced. Early in the war, artillery was organized around a few branches, each having a specific purpose. Field guns had a flatter firing trajectory and were used for direct fire. Howitzers fired heavier shells on a curved path so they could hit targets beyond line of sight. Mortars were firing at high angles and used for close support because they could follow the infantry close, being lighter and quicker to set up. And of course, we have anti-aircraft and anti-tank artillery, split into light and heavy configurations, with calibers ranging mostly from 20 to 155 millimeters, with some exceptions like super heavy railguns, such as the Schwerer Gustav, with a caliber of 800 millimeters, about 31.5 inches. You can guess which nation. Just kidding, German viewers don't get offended, so now most artillery throughout the war would remain pretty much the same in terms of their operation. Calibers were increased as rapid evolution of weapons constantly demanded more powerful shells, but overall the principle of the guns themselves was the same. The biggest difference came with the shells they were firing. So, let's now explain them briefly. The most common was high explosive, followed by shrapnel, anti-tank, anti-aircraft, smoke, illumination, with a small number of specialized rounds like high explosive anti-tank, and even poisonous gas, which the Japanese used against the Chinese in some cases, disguising them as smoke shells. But the important thing was the fuse. As you probably know, the fuse is this thing you screw into the shell's nose that would activate the explosive charge inside. Shells were usually transported without fuses screwed in to prevent catastrophes, and they'd be prepared just before being fired. Fired. They also had safety mechanisms to not arm before the shell was fired, so if you dropped it accidentally you wouldn't kill everyone around you. High explosive shells usually used point detonating fuses to explode on impact, nothing complicated about that. You aim, fire, and when the shell hits something, it explodes. Then, there were mechanical time fuses that were set to detonate the shell after a specific time from firing, anywhere from 0 to 30 seconds. This was useful against entrenched infantry, as airburst shrapnel raining down on them would take them out more effectively than exploding when hitting the soft ground that absorbed most of the explosion and shrapnel. However, to do this in practice was difficult, as you'd need precise calculations to not set shells to explode either too high above or after hitting the ground, and finding the right spot just wasn't practical. A fraction of a second's miscalculation and the shell would explode too soon or too late. The main purpose of time fuses was in the anti-aircraft role, especially used by the Germans in their infamous 88mm flak cannons. So let's talk about it for a second. A mechanical time fuse was set by hand with a special tool, or as the Germans did, they had an integrated device on their guns called a fuse setter, where they put the shell before firing that would automatically set the fuse for a specific time. 
So why time-fused shells for shooting down aircraft? Well, because with early radar technology, directly hitting a small, fast-moving fighter or big bombers flying at high altitudes was not easy to do. Aiming relied on observation and crude rangefinders, then corrections after each salvo. Hitting anything directly this way could only be luck. So, these shells were set to explode at a specific altitude near the enemy aircraft instead and deliver a spray of thousands of fragments in a wide radius that would damage planes, take out engines, or crew, as they were made from nothing more than aluminum skin and plexiglass. Those were those black puffs you'd see in the sky. And when you have an enemy formation of tens of bombers, and you have hundreds of quick-firing guns all guided at the same target by a central fire control system, there is now some real chance to actually hit something. German flak cannons downed horrific numbers of Allied aircraft, especially strategic bombers. But for each one shot down on average, they fired around 3,000 shells. So you see how much they relied on volume to hit their targets. The German system was revolutionary for the time because they used searchlights and radars to detect incoming enemy aircraft formations. Using that data, they determined altitude, speed, and course. Then, flak guns, flak by the way, comes from the German word for anti-aircraft gun, were positioned in batteries of four to eight guns and all connected by cables to a central command post where a large mechanical computer was positioned. This device was then given real-time data of where enemy aircraft was and doing aiming calculations based on them. Those calculations were then given to each gun crew, which dialed them into their guns. Even firing could be controlled through this system, so all the guns would fire at the same time. Remember that shooting at aircraft flying at high altitude meant that shells needed up to 20 seconds after firing to reach them, and they were predicting where enemy aircraft would be in that time, and firing ahead of it so the shell would meet it there, in theory. In practice, as you heard, despite all precise calculations, they still had to fire a lot of shells for only some to reach the right place, and damage or down enemy aircraft. Allies were at first using pretty much the same technology as the Germans for anti-aircraft defense, although on a smaller scale. Germans had to defend themselves against around-the-clock bombings through the Allied Joint Strategic Bombing Campaign, so they used artillery in anti-aircraft role to a much greater extent. However, everything would change when the United States and Britain engaged in all-out naval battles with the Japanese in the Pacific. Here, with aircraft carriers and fighters, dive bombers and torpedo bombers at the center of fighting, anti-aircraft defense for ships was needed more than ever to stop massed waves of aircraft swarming ships. Later in the war, this was even made worse with emergence of kamikaze. One well-placed bomb, torpedo, or hit by enemy aircraft loaded with explosives could sink the entire warship. Early in the war, ships carried 50 caliber machine guns, 20mm Ehrlichons, and 40mm Bofors anti-aircraft guns. And of course, there were 5-inch standard dual-purpose naval guns that could also be used against aircraft. But their protection was simply not enough. So, Americans began building up their anti-aircraft ship defense massively. First, it was through mounting a ridiculous number of guns, and mounting them in twin, triple, or quadruple configurations to increase the rate of fire and volume. The weight of all ordnance, a single ship could spit out in a short time, skyrocketed to several tons per minute. It was spectacular to see them firing all at once. Heavy Iowa-class battleships were carrying up to 20 quad-mounted 40mm Bofors guns and many more Ehrlichons and 50 caliber machine guns guns as the last line of defense when the enemy came in close. Now multiply that by several ships firing all at once. However, Japanese aircraft could still slip through this incredible cloud of fire. Japanese pilots perfected the tactic of high-speed dives and low-level approaches, attacking with tens of aircraft at the same time to overwhelm a ship's defenses and drop a bomb, launch a torpedo, or, well, ram themselves into the ship. 20 and 40 millimeter anti-aircraft shells of Allied ships had impact fuses and needed to hit enemy aircraft directly to destroy them. Now, the big 5-inch naval guns were used in the anti-aircraft role, similarly to German flak. Ship radar picked up targets and data, then through the fire control system, a time-fused shell was fired at the approaching aircraft. The problem was that the Japanese learned to fly in unpredictable patterns, often changing altitude, so ship shells were passing beside them and exploding too high or too low. A 5-inch shell weighed about 55 pounds and was more than capable of damaging several aircraft nearby, but setting it to detonate at just the right place was always the problem, and thousands of shells had to be fired to compensate for this. But then came the device that would solve 
this problem and turn the very same guns and shells into a terrifyingly deadly weapon. It so drastically changed the effectiveness of anti-aircraft guns and soon standard field artillery, as you're about to hear, that the enemy simply couldn't grasp what was going on. The proximity fuse idea started in Britain already at the beginning of the war. They tried to find some way to put a tiny sensor into the nose of a shell that would automatically detonate it at the right distance when it came close to a target. This way, there would be no need for all the calculations and setting time fuses. British engineers sketched workable radio circuit concepts in 1940 and passed the ideas to the United States for their engineers to take a look at. And who knows, maybe come up with something better. When American engineers did take a look, they treated the idea as top secret gold and jumped on it to make it work. The concept was working, but the much bigger problem was to make it work inside a shell. Artillery launch produced 20,000 G of acceleration, and a shell spinning through a rifled barrel also created powerful centrifugal force. Inside a fuse was delicate, fragile new technology, consisting of a tiny radio transmitter slash receiver, detector, amplifier, trigger tube, plus a power source and all the mechanical safeties, all inside a few inches of nose screwed onto a shell. Firing the shell would ruin such a sensitive device, so they had to solve that first. They introduced vacuum tubes and potted the whole electronic assembly in resin or wax to keep the parts in place during violent flight. Then, it had to activate the shell close to an enemy aircraft, but not get triggered by other things, like the ship that fired it, the sea, or obstacles. Funny thing to mention is that early versions would detonate even near seabirds, so quite a few unfortunate birds got blown up by anti-aircraft shells for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Through a painful and complicated process of errors and trials, they finally managed to make it work by mid-1942, just during the peak of the war. Testing showed kill rates over 50% better than time-fused shells, so immediately full-scale production was ordered and, as soon as humanly possible, they were delivered to frontline units. 20 and 40 mm shells were too small to house a proximity fuse, so first the 5-inch naval guns and other medium and large AA guns got them. So what did they come up with and how did it work? It was called variable time, VT, exactly to hide its real function. If we needed to explain in full technical detail how they worked, this video would become a scientific paper, so we won't do that. But I'll tell you in short how this technology operated and how it changed the course of the war completely. In simplified terms, for you and me to understand, the fuse was a miniature radar powered by a small internal battery after the shell had been fired. Now using a standard battery would be a problem if the shells were stored for a long time, as they were prone to corrosion and leaks. So they used instead a tiny sealed glass ampule that contained the electrolyte for a wet battery and was this way physically separated from the electrodes and inactive as long as the ampule was intact. After firing, the force would break the ampule, the fluid would spill out and activate the battery that gave power to the miniature radar for the short flight time. It sent a steady stream of radio energy while the shell was flying. When the shell came close to the enemy plane, the radar signal would change, and at a specific proximity, it was set to activate the detonator. It had safety mechanisms to arm only after launch, and after traveling some minimal distance so it wouldn't destroy the very gun that fired it. If it didn't come close to anything, it was set to activate regardless after some time. Basically, a self-destruction mechanism, which was very important to the Allies. They didn't want by any chance for the Germans to get their hands on this secretive technology and take away huge advantage the Allies now had. VTs were so valuable and so closely guarded a secret, on a par with atomic weapons that at first they were used only above water so the shells, if they failed to detonate, couldn't be recovered by the enemy. The US Navy cruiser, USS Helena, on the 5th of January 1943, was the first to fire proximity fuses in combat, scoring the first kill of a Japanese bomber. As ships received new shells for their 5-inch guns, their effectiveness skyrocketed overnight, completely shocking the Japanese. All of a sudden, enemy guns were estimated to be 50 times more effective. Average shells fired per kill dropped from several thousand to just about 150 rounds per kill. The British began using them in their anti-aircraft guns protecting the coast from German bombing raids and V-1 flying bomb attacks. They too overnight became unrecognizably more effective, reporting up to an 80% increase in hits, wreaking havoc on any German aircraft daring to come across the channel. This capture risk rule was held until late 1944, when proximity fuses were finally allowed to be used on the ground after insistence by General Eisenhower. They came just in time when the Germans launched the Ardennes offensive, throwing everything they had at the Allies in their last major gamble to capture desperately needed supplies. 
As the Battle of the Bulge broke out, some 200,000 VT-fused shells were delivered to artillery units under a secret code. What they proved to do against infantry is nothing short of horrifying. If you remember from the beginning, when I said shells could be time-fused to explode above the ground and shower deadly fragments overhead at infantry, well now they had a way to do this precisely with each shell exploding just above the ground over exposed troops. They massacred German infantry, who thought heavy fog protected protected them from artillery observation, and wandered in the open around allied lines. Even a trench, if you don't have overhead protection, would not save you from shells exploding above your head. German reports reached high command, explaining in shock how allied artillery all of a sudden became incredibly deadlier. Proximity fuses were so revolutionary that America put many factories under complete secrecy just to ramp up production as much as humanly possible. In just a couple of years, by the war's end, they produced around 22 million so-called VT fuses. Funny thing is that because of the enormous need for VT fuses during the war, America employed factories that had been producing Christmas lights and small radio bulbs to produce parts for fuses, and do not ask many questions about what they were. Because of this, production of decorative lights was almost completely stopped during the height of the war, and they couldn't be bought anywhere. Axis intelligence, of course, were alarmed to find out what was going on, but they never managed to produce equivalent technology. They experimented with their versions of proximity fuses, but they never reached production. The self-destruction feature and careful use by the Allies reduced the chances of finding a dud shell that could be reverse-engineered.